prepare for worship this morning as we quiet our hearts and minds and listen to this beautiful prelude. Good morning, everyone. I'm Deanna Self-Price, one of the pastors here at Shepherd of the Hills. And if you're with us for the first time, I want to say a wonderful hello to you and say thank you so much for being with us in worship. It's good to see everyone here this morning, and it's good to be able to worship together and share our praise and thanksgiving to God for all that God has done for us. We want you to know that in our worship setting, it is our practice to fill out a prayer and presence card. You should have received that as you came in this morning. Fill that out and drop that in the offering plate at the time of offering. We use that to stay in touch with all of you. We also invite you to share any comments or any questions that you might have or any new information like maybe an address change or a phone number change anything like that, that's the way to do it and be in touch with our church office. So we invite you to do that, to fill that card out and drop that in the offering plate at the time of offering. If you're with us today for the first time and you'd like to be introduced to our congregation, in front of you, you will find a pink welcome card. And all you have to do is fill that out. Please print so that we can read the handwriting, but fill that out and place that in the offering plate also at the time of offering and the ushers and all will do the rest and we'll introduce you a little bit later on in our church, um, in our worship service to our church family. But right now we're gonna stand and we're gonna sing some of our very favorite hymns and songs.
From day one, your spirit has brooded over the deep, your wind rushing, your breath filling. As creatures of the earth, we rejoice in life, using our breath and our being to raise this hymn of praise. Hallelujah to the sun-taught passion embracing the ground's great shoulders. Hallelujah for the growth from seed to plant greening the earth, providing us with the gifts of beauty and food. Hallelujah for generations of life tumbling one after another, life creeping, swimming, flying, running, below, above, upon, and within. Be with us in our worship today, God, as we sing with all the world our praises to your glory that shines in all that lives and breathes. Amen. <laughs> done so many things. You made them all so wisely. The earth is full of your creations. And then there's the sea, wide and deep, with its countless creatures, living things both small and large. There, there go, go the, the ships, ships on it, and, and Leviathan, which you made, plays in it. All your creations wait for you to give them their food on time. And when you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they are filled completely. But when you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you let loose your breath, they are created and you make the surface of the ground brand new again. Let the Lord's glory last forever. Let the Lord rejoice in all that has been made. God has only to look at the earth and it shakes. God just touches the mountains and they erupt in smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I'm still alive. Let my praise be pleasing to God. I'm rejoicing in the Lord. Let, Let my whole being bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. A reading from the book of Romans, chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand through him, and we boast in the hope of God's glory. 
But not only that, we even take pride in our problems because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. This hope doesn't put us to shame because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. While we were still weak, at the right moment, Christ died for ungodly people. It isn't often that someone will die for a righteous person, though maybe someone might dare to die for a good person. But God shows love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here ends the reading. Let me begin our sermon today with a story told by another preacher, Bishop Will Williman, retired from the Episcopacy and Duke University, where he was the professor of preaching and worship. The story that I'm sharing today is of one of his students who was in one of his classes entitled From Text to Sermon. Here are Bishop Williman's words as he tells this story. 
we asked the budding preachers to preach from one of the first 10 chapters of Genesis. He was from the Midwest, quiet, unassuming, never opened his mouth in class. He chose to preach from Genesis 7, the story of Noah and the flood. Genesis 7, he read in a monotone, a voice so soft we could hardly hear. Reading of how not long after God's creation of the world, the rains came down and the waters rose, inexorably rose, until life was choked out of every living thing. And then he began to preach. His sermon was a story. He told about how the summer before he had worked as a counselor at an exclusive camp somewhere in the beautiful Michigan woods. He made friends with another student who was also working as a counselor, and over the summer, their friendship deepened. When their duties were done in the late afternoon, they'd walk in the woods, kindred spirits, as they talked in this Arcadia, this Eden. It was an idyllic scene he painted for us, those summer days of youth walking with his friend in paradise. Yet what this had to do with Noah and the flood and Genesis 7, I wondered. Well, his friend invited him home one weekend, and they arrived at a little white frame Michigan farmhouse. There were barns and fences and a pasture, and everything was neat and tidy and in order and as idyllic and peaceful as those Michigan woods they had walked. And after supper that first night, his friend said, I've talked with my parents, and since you and I have become good friends, they have agreed to allow me to share something with you that means a great deal to us. The friend let him out back, behind the farmhouse to where there was a white barn. And the friend pushed open the big barn door. A couple bales of hay were removed, revealing yet another door. And when that door was opened, the light revealed a room full from floor to ceiling of posters, books, flags, guns, and armaments of various kinds. They were pictures of Hitler, Nazi insignia, and stacks and stacks of hate literature about African Americans and Jews. And the student stood there, paralyzed and in shock. All of this belongs to our church, said his host, picking up a semi-automatic rifle and opening its chamber. We're members of the Aryan nation. And all of this is prepared for the coming revolution when we take back our country. The student preacher said it was as if the veil separating creation from chaos was drawn back and the waters below surged forth sweeping away the dry land. The waters, the dark waters rose until life was choked from every living thing. Bishop Willimon continues, in the beginning the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. In Hebrew, the formless void 
is called Tahu Wabahu. It literally means chaos, confusion, something that is nothing. Tahu Wabahu. It's a strange sounding word, isn't it? Ominous and dark, muddled and forbidding and even menacing like some primordial ooze incapable of containment. Tahu Wabahu, a dark, formless, chaotic oil slick with an attitude. That's not nothing, that's something. And that's all there was, says Genesis, until there was God. And then the Bible says that God hovered over this giant oil slick that was churning and oozing and swirling around, and God took charge of it all. Spoke a word, and then there was light. And it was good. And God got busy again, separating out the earth from the waters and the dry land that then appeared. And then the land brought forth plants and fruit and seasons and living creatures and birds of the air. And again, it was all so good. And then, then God made humanity and invited us to be partners with God in caring for all that God had called into existence. And then God engaged in one more act of creation. God gave us all a Sabbath, a day apart from all that creating, so that we would have time to rest. And most importantly, tell each other this amazing story of how God brought life out of the swirling, churning, dark, primordial ooze. Do you know how old this story is today? It's about 2,500 years old. At least that's how old we think it is. Scholars have debated the dating of Genesis for years, but the best guess these days is that it was told sometime around the 6th century before Common Era, sometime around 539 before the Common Era, BCE. Can you imagine? 2,500 years old. Here's something else you might not know about this story. It wasn't told as a myth or a history or a science lesson. In our 21st century context, we always assume that stories like these in the book of Genesis were told as myths, explanation for things that really couldn't be explained. A small child wants to know how the world came into being, and so a parent or a teacher comes up with a story to answer that child's question. And then the story gets told over and over and over again until it becomes part of that people's culture. That's how we get myths, you know. They are stories that we tell ourselves about something or some event when we can't make sense out of why something is so or out of what has happened. That's why myths exist. And if we tell the story often enough, we sometimes end up believing the myth. If we tell it over and over and over again, it becomes part of us. But the story today from Genesis is not a myth, nor is it science or history. 
although there are certainly plenty of churches and preachers out there in the world that claim this story as such, as pure science or pure history. But that's not why the story was originally told, which is important to understand if we are ever going to be able to wrap our minds around the Hebrew Testament. Today's story is not a history lesson or a science lesson, but there is some history to be aware of in order to understand the creation story. You see, this story was told for a very specific reason, as a proclamation to the Hebrew people and the cultures that surrounded them about the God the Hebrew people worshipped. You might remember that in the 6th century, God's people fell on hard times. Israel was sacked by the Babylonians. Cities were laid waste. The temple was destroyed, and those who survived that invasion were carried off into exile as slaves. Think of, think of Afghanistan, think of Syria, think of Somalia, think of anywhere in the world experiencing total economic and social and political upheaval. And that's what it was like for God's people. 6th century BCE style. Their whole world was literally coming apart at the seams to who wabahu, swirling and churning and chaotic darkness that threatened to choke the life, the very life, out of God's people. And so a story was told a story about the darkness, about all of that chaos that was churning around them. A story was told. A story that they would have immediately understood from their own frame of reference. A story was told about the primordial ooze that threatened them and about Israel's God who could and would bring order out of all that chaos light out of the darkness and life out of all the death they had witnessed. And the story had power. It had meaning. And it helped God's people make sense of the existence in which they found themselves. It gave their existence relevance. The story was neither myth, nor was it a history or a science lesson. It was instead a proclamation that said that this is how the world sometimes feels to us. And no matter how deep the darkness, how chaotic the void. In our end, there is always a beginning. And in the beginning, there is always, always God. And that's why the story was told as a proclamation of hope when God's people sorely needed a word that creation and life was still all good. And over the centuries, God's people sorely needed that word. Because over the centuries, God's people have read these words to one another in the best of times, and in the worst of times. Because we all know how life can turn on a dime. 
It's a beautiful sunny day and all's right with the world and it's ordered and it's neat and it's tidy and then that phone rings and there's an accident or there's an illness or there's a biopsy or a report or there's a loss or there's some new revelation that causes our whole world to come apart at the seams. And we are paralyzed. We are paralyzed like that student and we don't know what to do next. Maybe we turn off the cell phone. Maybe we stagger across the room to find a chair. Or maybe we go to the window and we look out and we ask ourselves, where did the sun go? Where is the light? As we feel ourselves sinking, sinking into the chaos, into the Tohu Wabahu. What happened, we wonder? What happened to the well ordered, neat, tidy, beautiful, sunny day? What happened to? And it was good. Sometimes it turns out that chaos is only a phone call away. The creation story is a story about that. Bishop Williman writes, in those times when we, like the prophet Jeremiah, look upon our lives and sigh, disaster overtakes disaster, the whole land is laid waste. I looked on the earth and lo, it was primordial ooze, and to the heavens they had no light. It is in such moments when the earth shakes and the mountains crumble and chaos bubbles forth that we turn like the vulnerable children we are to an old, old story we learned in childhood. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that it was good. Did you know that the words... In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth can also be rendered. When God began creating the heavens and the earth. Now that's important. It's true and it's important theologically. And here's why. Because it means that the act of creation is never really finished. It never stops. It's not fixed at any point. Like, for example, a billion years ago because God never stops being creative. God never stops being creative, and creation is literally going on right now, right here under our noses. God never stops wrestling with the Tahu Wabahu, but always keeps working to bring something good out of whatever threatens to overwhelm God's people. God is always working for our good, bringing a new creation out of the chaos in which we find ourselves. And the Hebrew people living in exile, having lost everything, being surrounded by cultures that embraced numerous gods and numerous goddesses and numerous myths, needed to be reminded that their God was different. Their God was the creator. Their God was the one with the power to take on the dark and swirling, formless void and bring something good out of it. They needed this story. Oh, they needed it desperately. So do we. Especially in those moments when we are paralyzed like that student on that sunny day, that sunny Michigan day, standing out behind that neat and tidy white farmhouse when the door of that barn is open and we see that things are not as they seem. And it all bubbles up and threatens this beautiful creation. We need this story. When our world is coming apart at the seams, 
We need to hear the message that God is still creating, still bringing good out of a primordial mess. To who Wabahoo is nothing to our God. And deep down, deep down, we know that. We know that, and that's why we're here this morning. That's why we come to every Sabbath to remind each other of the wonderful God that we worship who has created and is still creating. We gather on the Sabbath to hear the creation story and most of all, to proclaim it as a blessing for ourselves, as a blessing for each other, and yes, indeed, for the whole world. Amen.